do that and then I won't forget. Uh, so, lab books, next week is the last lab. It's really pretty short and easy to fill in. So we'll do the lab and your handbooks in at the end of lab next week. All right, so if you're not sure if you've got anything missing or anything like that, make, you know, be certain to come in and check with me because there are some deductions on the final hand in it. There are work, work pieces missing. All right. We've stayed pretty tight to the syllabus though, so it should be relatively easy to check. It's not going to be chapter 14, it'll be chapter 15 in this edition. So today we're going to um, go over some of this information about ergogenic aids. And uh, that's not always something negative, right? There's a lot of info in this chapter about different. different ergogenic aids that you might be interested in depending on what your event is. So I'm going to pick a couple of them, take a quick look at them, then we'll do an activity on this, okay? And, um, and then you can pick the one that you're most interested in to play around with on the internet. Really 
technical version of ergogenic aids. Um, ergogenics are anything that um, improve pra training practice or performance, some phenomena. So actually something like home crowd is technically, bless you, technically an ergogenic aid, right? although you don't have any control over that. The opposite to ergogenic is ergolytic. Right? Ergolytic um, substances are things that have a negative impact on performance. And one of the things the chapter tries to point out is that often people will take something that they think is ergogenic and actually it is ergolytic. So for example, um, dancers or some athletes, if they get very nervous, will have a drink. They right? will take some alcohol because they feel it calms them down, helps them to focus. But actually, any alcohol at all, teeny amounts, impact reaction time and performance. So, it's not truly ergogenic, even if it does make them feel a little more calm. Actually, overall, the impact is negative, right? So we had, uh, when I was in undergrad, we had a really super lab that we did that looked at the effect of alcohol on reaction time. Um, but I'm not allowed to do it with you guys, but it's such a cool experiment because you can take just a very small amount of alcohol and within 10, 15 minutes redo a reaction time test and you feel fine. I mean, I could call it on some sort, you think. But the response on your reaction time is quite dramatic. So it's, it would be a very cool experiment to run on campus, I think, especially um, to encourage people not to drink and drive. But, oh, I've got a thing. We could go out, actually, maybe we could do it during a football game or before a football game on the, <laughs> perhaps that would be a fine, right? Now, we're, now, we, now we have tailgating, we could all gather and do our reaction time experiment. Aww. <laughs> so, um, okay, so let's take brief look at the blood doping idea first of all. Right? So blood doping is a way of improving oxygen delivery so the athletes that use this technique are going to be endurance type athletes. So cyclists, uh, possibly marathon, um, extreme 24-hour racing, that kind of event, right? And as with many of the ergogenic aids that are not approved, part of the problem is it actually does do what you want it to do, right? If it's done properly, it will improve endurance performance in the short term. So, it's very tempting as an endurance athlete to resort to this kind of edge for a race. It was banned in 1984 um, by the Olympic, World Olympic Committee. And the original method was that they would remove red blood cells, put them in a fridge or a freezer, and then give the body a chance to make additional red blood cells to make up the deficit, and then add the old red blood cells back in. Right? So if you put red blood cells into a fridge, then you lose about 40% of your red blood cells, and you've only got about five weeks of training before you have to use that blood. If you put it into a freezer, you only lose about 
of the red blood cells. And obviously, because it's frozen, you've got that much longer. So if you want to have a 10 or 12 week training program before you add them back in, you've got that time. Using red blood cells from the same person, fancy term is tautologous. But occasionally, historically, they would use red blood cells from another person. And obviously this starts to really raise the risk quite dramatically because if that blood was not screened well before it was frozen, then or you can pick up all kinds of problems from someone else's blood, right? So the effectiveness of the technique is going to depend upon how much of the red blood cells you manage to keep viable, right? The timing of putting them back in, how you're storing them, right? So you've got maybe 10 weeks of training, you need a minimum of five weeks to start to see those red blood cells really replenishing. So it takes a while, but it does have a pretty big event, um, effect. So if you um, if you're running a five mile race, then you likely to improve your time by around five seconds. That's a that's a big difference, right, on where you end up in that race. So the risks though oh that graph is quite interesting. So here's here's VO2 max before for these people, here's putting it back in, and you can see the improvement, but it doesn't last, that's the thing. You've only got a week, 10 days or so to get the race in before the effects start wearing off. So the timing of putting the red blood cells back in is pretty crucial. be an increase in blood viscosity, right? if I'm putting more things back into the same amount of fluid, the fluid is going to get a bit thicker, so if you've got any kind of uh, weakening in the artery wall like we talked about <coughs> that you're not aware of, it could cause a stroke. Um, it can increase your risk for blood clotting. All right. Obviously, as I said, if the blood's not screened, possibly hepatitis uh, or HIV. So, pretty big risks. But if it's done properly by someone who knows what they're doing and everything is controlled, the outcome is going to be a pretty significant improvement in oxygen uptake and, and performance. So it got banned, and so athletes, trainers, doctors, chemists came up with plan B. Right? So they started to use erythropoietin to stimulate the body's own mechanism for making red blood cells. So this is the hormone that we talked about when we go up in altitude. If we stay up at altitude for several weeks, we start to make more red blood cells because we see higher levels of erythropoietin in response to the low oxygen and that stimulates the marrow to make more red blood cells. Right? So this is a homegrown hormone and they either use real 
erythropoietin. I think now they have come up with one that's kind of a synthetic version. But um, you can see the timeline. They got in a few years of using this to benefit performance before the IOC banned this as well in 1990. So they started about 85 using this. Um, and by the late 1980s, about 18 cyclists had died from um, problems surrounding using erythropoietin. So using it does improve performance. So again, we've got the problem. There's a very big temptation if all you need is half a second to win a race then there's a big temptation for people to use something that is natural right, to improve performance. Um, but there were a lot more, actually it's more risky than the original blood doping version because what happens with erythropoietin is they give you erythropoietin Eating, but you don't know. I mean, everybody's individual response to that hormone is different. So once you've taken the erythropoietin, you're no longer in control of how many red blood cells you make in response to that dose. Okay. So the risk of blood clotting and uh, heart failure or embolisms is that much higher because you could overcreate red blood cells and make your blood really thick and sticky and unable to do its job properly. Right? So um, <coughs> side effects of using erythropoietin have been reported as headaches, cramping, um, but the benefits are pretty, as I say, pretty significant. So it's always a a difficult argument with high-level athletes because they don't consider it cheating per se, although it really is, right? It's a benefit that was not gained through just training and ability. Then oxygen supplementation is also considered an ergogenic aid. Again, the idea is, can I increase oxygen delivery to the muscles? Um, and it does potentially increase the levels of oxygen that are carried by the hemoglobin in the bloodstream. It's not really going to be very useful to you at sea level then, because at sea level, your hemoglobin should be 100% saturated. So oxygen supplementation is something that's used as you go up in altitude by some athletes. Right? And uh, they've looked at what happens if you administer it before, during, or after performance or, or training. Um, it seems to increase performance a little bit during the game. So sometimes you'll see um, football games that are played at altitude and on the sidelines when they're changing over a fence and defense, they'll be using an oxygen mask. So there is actually some research that supports that that may benefit them during the game a little bit. Um, and it seems to benefit immediately after the game with recovery. What they haven't shown is that if I do this, it will benefit the next performance. It's a very acute timeline with using oxygen. Okay? There's no kind of chronic, long-term effect. I've got, to, I've got to use it every time. But this is quite useful. Right? If I've got to play two or three games in a week, then 
recovery becomes quite important in order to be able to play my best for the next game. So there's some quite positive research looking at using the oxygen. You've just got to remember that there's not going to be anything chronic going on. Um, it's probably going to be more useful for training because of the recovery idea, unless you've got several games in a row. But um, at moderate altitudes, it does look like it does some good, pardon me. Uh, we'll jump through the buffers. Okay, hold on, let me just mention. All right, so buffers, the oxygen, the blood doping, the erythropoietin, and the oxygen supplementation are all for aerobic events. Buffering is trying to increase your body's ability to balance levels of acid that are being produced when you're exercising. So buffers are used by an anaerobic athlete who is using glycolysis as an energy system. Right? They also would not benefit an ATP PC person. Okay? So the ergogenic aid is very specific to the system that you're using to generate ATP for the event that you're doing. Okay. So if I've got increases in acidity which lead to fatigue because the enzymes don't like the levels of acid and slow down, then if I can balance that acidity by adding some alkaline, or over here, I think you call it a base. Right? If I add a base, it gives me a little window longer before the acid levels build up to the point where we see fatigue. So it just gives me a fraction longer that I can train hard or compete hard. So things like sodium bicarbonate, um, People will take sodium bicarbonate, just mix it with water and drink it. Um, bicarbonate loading causes some problems though with gastrointestinal issues for a lot of people. Get cramping or bloating or diarrhea, none of which is really then beneficial to the performance. So you've got to be a little bit careful about the trade-off. Um, you have to take about 300 milligrams per kilogram of body weight to increase all-out performance in a relatively short event. So that's quite a lot. So for some people, that just gives them such bad stomach problems that it's not worth the benefit to the performance. Okay. Um, you can drink lots and lots and lots and lots of water to try to move it through the system. Some people say using sodium citrate instead of sodium bicarbonate works well. Doesn't seem to cause so many GI issues. Um, phosphate loading is another one you might have heard of. Um, phosphate loading possibly might improve time to exhaustion, although the research is very equivocal about it. Um, again, might be more useful for recovery um, if I'm trying to rebuild ATP in between bouts. But there's not a lot of research that really supports phosphate loading, although it is something you hear and read about. And there are available supplements in a health shop to, that are marketed to athletes to improve performance taking extra phosphate. But there's not a lot of support there. Steroids, again, kind of natural, except that they have synthetic versions of them as well. Um, 
And again, the problem is they do exactly what you want from them. If you take steroids and you train hard, okay, and there's the key, someone who cheats and uses steroids did not put the work in. Okay? They still had to work their butt off to get the result. It's just the result is more than it would have been without the additional help. Okay? So it's massive. If, if you ever spend time in a, in a professional bodybuilding gym or with professional bodybuilding, I mean, it is really very dramatic, the change in strength and size that you see when they're using this. Um, but there's so many negatives to using it. Right? Yes, it makes me stronger. Yes, it makes me bigger. Yes, it aids with recovery so I can train harder again in the next session. Um, but some of these negative effects appear to be irreversible. So once, once you start to see some of these, that could be it. You could have wrecked your long-term health with no coming back from it. So you see some liver damage. Um, once it's damaged, it doesn't reach memory, right? And you're done. <laughs> your liver's not going to function properly. Um, increases in, these are our bad guys, remember, the LDLs. These are the bad guys, and using steroids increases the bad guys, decreases the good guys, and so long term, you're at more risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, and then that take it over a long time, you know, generally what you do again with steroids, you don't test positive for steroids in a competition, because that's not when you use, right? So taking blood tests and things in a competition doesn't catch steroid use very much. It's the unannounced appearance at training gyms and things to take samples where they catch people out because it's a training aid, not a competing aid. Right? So they don't take it constantly all the time, They'll take it for the period of the program where the goal is to increase size, for example. Right? So they'll take it for that window of the program, and then they come off it again, and then they take it again the next time. So in men that have taken it over time, we see some pretty dramatic <laughs> effects on virility, sperm count, right? All, they start to develop baldness that is not hereditary. Um, a lot of the men will start to develop what looks like breast tissue here. Okay. Um, increases some cancers for women can change their menstrual cycle or, or cancel their menstrual cycle so they may become amenorrheic. Um, again, you could see some baldness, changes in the clitoris, the voice deepens, right? But these are not. And yet, even though we know this, people get caught taking steroids all the time. And the bigger problem is the people who get caught are well known, looked up to. And so then that encourages teenagers to be taking this stuff, right? Or encourages high school football coaches to suggest that perhaps you might want to take this supplement. But don't tell anybody I'm giving it to you. Okay? So. Um, they've got clever at picking it up, but then the people that are using it or providing it, supplying it, become more clever at developing designer androgens that don't respond in the same way to the tests, so they can get the benefit of a 
muscle stimulator that is not as easily detectable. And so the people who are creating the drugs are always one step ahead of the people who are testing the drugs. So it's an ongoing problem. Um, sometimes they'll take masses of diuretics to flush the steroids out of the system quickly. Well, but then you risk being dehydrated and the issues that that causes. So it's, the more you find out about it, the more unrealistic it becomes to bother taking it. HGH, human growth hormone, was originally um, used to help children who don't make their own or don't make enough and therefore don't grow properly. And so it was a clinical drug to try to help young children stay on their growth curve. And then the athletic population went, oh, that's great. <laughs> Let's use that one. Okay. So, again, it's anabolic. It stimulates growth. Uh, it doesn't just stimulate growth of muscle, though. So people who abuse HGH sometimes develop acromegaly, um, which is abnormal bone growth. So women get like wider jaws or hands, bones in your hands grow big, or you know, weird things. Um, so again, there's plenty of negative effects to balance whether or not it's really beneficial. Um, it stimulates fat loss like you've never seen. I, I, I watched a lady at a bodybuilding gym I was working at use HGH and you drop fat mass like, overnight. It's incredible. Incredible. <laughs> it's really, it's, I don't know, it, so a lot of the female body, but you know, when, when you look at those pictures and they're really, really, really lean and we know that women can't achieve that, okay? a female athlete cannot be 3% body fat, period. Doesn't matter how hard she trains. That is not natural. So if there's a female athlete where you can see all the vasculature in her muscles and you can see all her lymph nodes, right? The body fat levels are too low and that cannot be natural. It can't be. Women don't have the hormonal makeup to get that lower level of body fat naturally. Right. So, there's a lot of it going on, sadly. Um, another one that's around at the moment is HCG. Right. So, you can walk into Walmart and buy this off the shelf. You don't even have to go to the chemist. It's just sitting on the shelf. Okay. And HCG is... Um, is was declared by the FDA to be fraudulent in 2011, and yet it is still on the shelf. Okay. Um, so in their in their uh, eyes, it should it's illegal because it's false marketing. Um, it doesn't do okay. <laughs> it 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 doesn't do what they say it does. According to the research, it's not effective at achieving what they tell you it will do. And it hasn't been around long enough for there to be any long-term studies for anyone to know whether it's safe. And yet, it's right there on your shelf. Right? So as far as the FDA are concerned, they've gone after a couple of different companies and tried to sue them for marketing this. Um, GNC market it as a homeopathic supplement. The FDA don't have any control over homeopathy. So as soon as you put it under that label, there's nothing they can do. Okay. 
Apart from which, if you can see it in the dark, the marketing point is disgusting as a female, I have to say. <laughs> That's, I find that very disturbing. <coughs> but hey, that's just an old stream on those kinds of things. Um, so, human growth hormone. Uh, let's see, I want you to do, I want you to get time to play. Um, amphetamines, speed. A lot of athletes will use speed as an upper, trying to get them going and excited. Um, it does exactly that, right? You don't sleep very well if you take this stuff. Um, but it increases blood pressure and it increases your heart rate. So again, long term, it's not a healthy effect. And they used to use amphetamines in the old days with um, young movie stars in the big uh, movie companies. Right, so people like Judy Garland and uh, Mickey Rooney and those that kind of era, right, with black and white films where they had these young uh, what's her name with the curly hair? Elizabeth Taylor? No. Uh, younger than Monroe. Younger than Monroe. Anyway, all those oh, kind of child uh, stars, they wanted them to do 12, 14 days on the set. Right? So they would give them amphetamines to keep them going on the set and get them up. But then they couldn't sleep. So then they would give them sleeping pills to put them to sleep, but then they couldn't wake them up to get them back on the set the next day. So then they would give them more amphetamines to get them going again the next day. And so that's part of the reason why so many of that population, you read stories all the time, very, very many of those child stars became drug addicts of one form or another because of the abuse from the film studios when they were on set, which is ghastly. Um, but it does the job, right? It does exactly what you want it to do. So it increases basal metabolic rate, so some people will use it as, um, as a weight loss tool. It increases the availability of free fatty acids in the bloodstream, breaks down triglycerides, and so if, if I'm doing a lot of aerobic work, it gives me access to more fats to use as an energy source so I can lose more weight. Um, there's all kinds of sneaky ways of using it, but it's got some pretty dangerous side effects. So it can lead to heart attacks, obviously, if my heart rate is raised constantly, then the chance of a heart attack is increased. Um, ephedrine and pseudoephedrine, again, often used as weight loss tools. Um, pseudoephedrine is in a lot of uh, cough medicine, decongestion, kind of uh, allergy med type things. So you've got to be careful when you're taking those um, because they can cause insomnia, irritability, but it does seem to improve power. So there's, there are so many of these kinds of aids out there, it's quite crazy. People use diuretics as an ergogenic aid, which based on our previous discussion on fluids makes no sense at all. Um, but particularly athletes in weight class sports or who have to look nice will use diuretics to try to um, drop, drop water content so that their muscles show through more. Caffeine. Now caffeine is interesting at the college level because it is not banned 
as an ergogenic aid by the IOC. But it is banned by the NCAA. So if you've got an athlete who's competing internationally and for college, they can't take capping because it's okay at the international level. Um, coffee, tea, the obvious ones, Coca-Cola, chocolate has quite a lot of caffeine in it. Um, and it's got many complicated mechanisms, but it does increase time to exhaustion. So there are some really fascinating studies looking at caffeine and marathons, for example, um, where it is shown to be beneficial. Um, taking some caffeine before a weight training session has been shown to be beneficial because you can train harder for a little bit longer. The longer I train, the more benefit I get from the training. Right? So, um, short-term intense events as well. So, the, the benefits are pretty substantial. I've seen some literature that suggests that for women, taking caffeine with aerobic works increases fat metabolism. Um, so there's some really interesting literature, and as long as you're not working with college athletes, it's relatively, there's, there's not a lot of negative. Now some people are very sensitive to caffeine. It does raise heart rate. So if you have, you can't, again, you can't give a global amount. You can't say to one person, oh, drink two extra cups of coffee, and to someone else, drink two extra, because two extra cups of coffee may be too much for one person, and only just enough for someone else. So it is a, it's a highly, your individual response to caffeine is, is important to take notes on. Um, for some people, not for everybody, it does impact sleep patterns. Other people can take caffeine right before they go to bed and it makes no difference whatsoever to their sleep pattern. So, there is, I think there's some very interesting research, particularly if you're working with a fitness group, if you're, if you're personal training, that might be worth looking at with regards to caffeine. But as I said, if, if you're working with athletes, if you want to be a college coach, mix the caffeine. Because the NCAA have a window that is allowable. Right? You're allowed, I don't know what the measures are, but say maybe you're allowed one cup of coffee a day. But the problem is, everybody reacts differently. So one cup of coffee may put one athlete over the legal limit and get them banned. And another athlete is no, could take four cups of coffee a day and still not be over the legal limit for the NCAA. So the best thing, the best advice for you to give college athletes is don't take any caffeine. Don't drink coffee, don't drink caffeinated teas, don't drink sodas that have caffeine, it doesn't matter whether they're brown, read the ingredients, clear colored sodas have caffeine in them as well. Okay. There's lots of things that have caffeine sneaked in. Some of the power bars sneak caffeine in because it's beneficial at keeping you awake and therefore training harder. Right. You've got to read the ingredients. Because it, it pops up all over the place where you don't expect it to. <laughs> Some people will get headaches. Some people don't get headaches. All right. So there's too much stuff. Okay, you get the idea. There's tons and tons of information in this chapter. Um, what I would like you to do as your workbook piece is to um, 
look at the chapter and find the ergogenic aid that interests you the most. Right? So it may be a positive one or a negative one. So you might be really interested in looking at, if you're a sprint athlete, you might be really interested in looking at creatine because creatine loading appears to have a small benefit to sprint methods. But it's got to be ATP PC system, not glycolysis. So a 400 meter athlete doesn't benefit from creatine loading. Right? Short, fast, hard might benefit from creatine loading, although there are some side effects you might want to look out for. Right? So you could look at creatine if you wanted to, or look at growth hormone abuse, or one of the other supplements. Um, there's one, there's, oh, there's so many. There was one in Hawaii that looked like it was leading to liver failure. Several athletes developed liver failure that they linked to a particular substance. There's all kinds of information. So pick one that you find interesting and find a media item about that substance. And then I want you to compare what the media item said to what your textbook says and see, was the media item portraying this ergogenic aid correctly or were they stretching the truth? Or were they out and out fibbing? Right? So it could be an, it could be um, an article in a newspaper or a magazine. It could be a blog on the internet. It could be a newscast or a podcast. It could be an advert on the television or in a paper or a magazine. Right? So find something that is connected to the ergogenic aid that you pick. And then do a short brief, like a paragraph, not an essay, mm -hmm. right? A brief comparison of how accurately the media item was portraying what we know from the science. Does that make sense? Right? <coughs> I want to include chapter 15 in the last exam, in exam 5. All right. I will think about that. Well, no. I am, okay, let me change that. It is going to be in exam 5. Right? What I will do is I will give a very large hint in the review session as to because there's so much in this chapter and if you are just looking at the one thing that interests you it might not be the thing that I picked to go into the exam. Alright? So take a brief overview of the whole chapter. Find your one thing that you want to look at. Okay? And then I will give a very large hint in the review session as to what sections of the chapter might be on the exam. So maybe on this paragraph. Just put it in, it's the workbook's due next week. So and just the, the exam. Exam for 313 is 9th of May. Oh, my heart. I think it's the Tuesday at 12.30. That's the day of the exam. With 12.30? That's what the exam schedule said. They have been known to get the exam schedule really screwed up, though, so if someone else has another exam at that time and you can't be here, let me know. What if we scheduled something on that time already? Oh dear. <laughs> what do you want me to say to that? What do you want me to say to that? Are you busy Monday? Crazy. 
Can I bring it to the same time? Of course. Okay. <laughs> Is it Shirley Temple you were thinking of? 